You're now listening to Hack and Grow Rich with Shaheen Shayan and his co-host, Bart Baggett, where we discuss hacking your way to success and the unconventional paths to unreasonable success with the people who've been there. And now, the author of Billion, How I Became King of the Thrill Pill Cult, Shaheen Shayan. Shaheen, thanks so much for taking the time to join me today. This is going to be this is going to be a lot of fun. I am excited. All right, right out of the gate, um, you know, I the book, the hook, right away. Like, I mean, I read I read Chris Voss's uh, forward, which was which kind of set the tone, but it was a different tone than I expected. <laughs> so I get into it, and it's just like, and I read a lot of books for for when I when I talk to guests, and this is the most unconventional of the books that i've read in that it read very and you and you preface this you say like some of this stuff you know you've got a you got a disclaimer at the beginning but this book read like it was the nice um i don't read a lot of fiction but i'm like oh this is going to be something that's going to hook me in now let's be up front this is not fiction this is not a fictional account this is your account of how you you know kind of built this business of yours but one of the things that hooked me right out of the gate, other than, you know, the idea of, you know, the introduction, which was, you know, as soon as you pick up this book, everybody read the, int- the introduction is going to sink. It's just going to cinch you. I'm seeing names in throughout the book like Richard Dawkins, Alan Watts, you know, things that I wouldn't have necessarily expected based on that very introduction. So can you explain to me, you know, uh, to give a bit of a, a sense for people who are who don't know you, um, but based on based on the kind of the, the way that you start the book, where it's very like right out of the gate, you're like, whoa, who is this dude? And then all of a sudden I'm reading later, like he, you know, into Richard Dawkins, into Alan Watts, like those seem really incongruent considering what the introduction was kind of all about. Yeah. And I think, look. This is some of the stuff that I think has been lost, particularly in recent days. I oftentimes talk to people about the loss of nuance. We are nuanced creatures. And what the mind wants to do, and this is perfectly understandable because it is a survival instinct, it is something that comes from our evolutionary history, is that we need to simplify things in order to know if we can survive. So when we look at somebody coming at us or some kind of creature or some kind of event, we look at the three things that those could possibly be, right? Can we feed? Can we fornicate? Or do we need to flight, right? Do we need to fly away from it? And for the most part, that served us well back in the day. But now, things are much more intricate. Uh And I think that, especially those people that you mentioned, I talk about in the books, Alan Watts, and and the work of people like Richard Dawkins, and and a, a wide range of people. It's it's it, intense. I mean, you, I mean, I looked at it. I'm like, okay, who else is mentioned? I go back to the index. I'm like, okay, this is this guy's deep. This guy goes places that I didn't necessarily expect him to go to. Uh, based on based on what I read right out of the gate. So that's what one of the things that caught me. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. And I think it's it's possible now, especially at this time in history, for us to be for us to be more complete versions of ourselves. And we can do that by having varied interests. That's like a lot of the times now people are like, oh my God, are you Republican or Democrat? Well it's like, well, you know, I, I'm you know, left on some things, right on other things. I like to be a free thinker. I like to have my own opinions about things. And in general, I think that's why it's good to try to collect as many viewpoints as possible. You know, my martial arts instructor, since I was 13, uh, always taught us, you know, based on Bruce Lee's philosophy, that you absorb what's useful, discard what's useless, and add what's specifically your own. That was something that Bruce came up with in the the art and science of what he did, which he later named Jeet Kune Do. But life and business are much the same way, in my opinion, Mike. I don't know if you agree, but I, I, I really feel that you've got to be able to suspend judgment. You have to be able to, don't be stupid about stuff, but be able to suspend judgment when you can do so intelligently and utilize the best things from anything. Another one of my mentors would always teach me, I'm going to turn that off so it doesn't ding, but one of my mentors used to teach 
that everyone you meet will teach you something. Mm -hmm. And it's such a great mindset to go into life. Because sometimes you're sitting across from some dude and you're like, what the fuck am I doing here with this asshole? Like, dude, I'd rather be clipping my toenails right now. That is like higher on my list of priorities. And then you realize that this person is teaching you patience. This person is teaching you compassion. This person is teaching you empathy. Or there might be somebody at the other end of this person. Or you may just need to break through the ice, go past this person's masks and projections of who they are, and you might learn something about them. Yeah, what, one, of, one of my really good friends now who actually does a lot of filming for me, um, when I first met him, uh, he was in a theater group. We were both doing theater. And he had this persona that, you know, it was very, he was a young kid. He's younger than me, about 10 years younger or so, maybe a little bit more. And there was, uh, I mean, he was very talented, still is. And, uh, but he was very standoffish and he had this aura of arrogance about him. And I wasn't the only one that felt that way. Everyone else in our troop kind of felt that way. And then I went and saw him do a show. I remember distinctly, it was at this like seedy little club in Victoria, which you could imagine is probably not as seedy as some other clubs that you would go to in other parts of, of the world. And I'm sitting with my brother-in-law and we watch that, this sketch troupe and he's part of it. And he's wearing a New Jersey Devils jersey. And I'm a fan of the New Jersey Devils. So I'm like, who else in Victoria, Canada would own a New Jersey Devils jersey, considering that we're on opposite coast? Like, this guy must have more to him than just this, this mask, this, this aura. And I remember I ran into him about a week later at the, at the place that we all normally performed at. And we just started, I, instead of talking about theater, I talked to him about hockey. I said, so I wear the Devils jersey. And all of a sudden, it was a different conversation it was a different person it was a, like i because there was this opening and it wasn't um something that he expected nor nor you know he didn't expect that all of a sudden the guards came down we've been really good friends ever since our families hang out together so yeah it, i think that the world operates in shades of gray and i'm so so it gets really frustrating when you know people who especially some people say i'm a free thinker and then they lean so hard in one direction I'm like are you like are you you know yeah. what i mean like where does that fall in um i want to talk about getting things done it comes up in the book on a couple of occasions yeah. i i've had the pleasure of chatting with david allen on a few occasions um we both presented at south by you're gonna pull out do you have the see i that's the new edition which i love i got the original somewhere the original so this is this is this is actually something I want to talk about because the transformation of just that methodology is is also nuanced, right? When you think about it, the core elements of it are still the same, right? Getting things done has the capture all that, but the words softened over time. I don't know if you noticed that when you read the book, but the the idea of capture became collect. Like there was a softening. Um did you find as you went through your entrepreneurial journey that you mentioned nuance? that nuance really ha is the key to the sustainability that you've had with what you've been doing over the years since the 90s? Like, do you think that that's been one of the things that is is, is kept you going? And not only kept you going, but kept you um, excited about what you're doing? So I'd say it's the opposite of that, actually. Interestingly enough, I think that people that are high achievers, for the most part, there are exceptions. <clears throat> or broad strokes people. I think when you look at the people that are making impact on a wholesale level, as Bill Gates would say, someone like Bill Gates, um, those, those people, generally speaking, can't deal with all the specialized knowledge. They have an understanding of it. Like Elon has an understanding of how rockets work and are sent to space. But if you asked him where the 316th you know, titanium grommet is for the booster, he probably wouldn't know, but he's got somebody who does. Right. And for me, I realized that getting really myopic on very specific things actually takes away. And worrying too much about details, hence nuance and, and all these types of things, isn't important when you do what I do, which is launch products and teach people how to launch products. So my goal is to impact people wholesale, which is what I do when you know I have an Amazon course now. I teach people how to start Amazon businesses, sell them on Amazon. And what I do is I get people out of all that detail-oriented perfection by paralysis. Now, you need scientists who do that kind of stuff. 
Like mm-hmm. the, the guy who invented the vaccine, I want that motherfucker to be as detail oriented as possible. <laughs> I want that dude to be like Mr. Detail. Yeah. But the guy who's running the company, he's got, he's, he's like, it's like my wife says, she can move any piece of furniture with two fingers. Yeah. <laughs> right. Just by pointing. Yeah. And that's what you want to be. As, as David Allen would say, you want to delegate, you want to yeah. be a delegator. And when you when you learn to do that and to do it effectively, then you don't you don't need to focus on the nuance. You have other people focusing on it, and you know depend. De- I mean, we're 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 speaking in in real broad strokes, but once you get real real specific about stuff, then there are certain things where you have to talk about nuance. But for personal development, it's all about nuance. Have you have you? always been good at delegating and if not how did you get good because i think that that one of the things when when i talk to people about you know again the idea of the list right they have these massive projects and they don't I mean one of the things i say is the reason you don't delegate is you don't break them down you don't break the projects down you, you look at your list and it's it's build build product and that's the <laughs> that's yeah just like insane you need to break that down into smaller particles but then of course People look at that, and go, "Oh my gosh, there's way too many things on here now." No, they were there's the same amount of things. You just see them all now, um, right. which helps you delegate. But have you always like delegation? You're absolutely right. Is key. Have you been always really? Has that been one of your superpowers, or is it something that yeah. you had to kind of work towards? So look, you 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 have to have systems in place. So a lot of our time in the early days was spent building systems. Hmm. And <laughs> excuse me. Um, and now with Amazon, um, what we we realize is that systems are what it's all about. When when you have systems in place, um, you can afford to relax a lot more. The second thing you need is you need people to execute on those systems. So you need people to delegate to. Okay. Those two things are more or less non-negotiable. Once you have systems in place and you have people to delegate to, then you can shift your role as an entrepreneur to being a coach for your people rather than a micromanager. And if you can become a coach, most of my time is spent coaching people. Well, what do you want to do? Oh, I want to uh, get the, uh, you know, the Johnson account uh, back online. Okay, how do you want to do that? Well, I'm going to call Mr. Johnson and tell him, you know, that we can do it for the price he wants. Okay, fantastic. When do you want that to, when do you, when do you want to make that happen? Oh, well, I want to do it today. Okay, great. And what if he says no? Oh, uh, okay. If he says no, then I've got this and this plan. Okay, great. I didn't tell him anything. In fact, I, I used very little brain power. I just allowed them to tell me what they were going to do and then let them take action and just really acted as a coach. I might say a couple kind words, genuine, like, Hey, you know, you've always been really great at bringing in new clients and I know Mr. Johnson loves you. So, uh, you know, this, this one should be easy for you and that's it. And that becomes your role as a, as, as, as a leader. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I was talking to Keith Ferrazzi about this when he was on the podcast before and, and the idea of time leadership versus time management. And I mean, just getting rid of that management thing because management to me is it's a lot about moving things around, whereas leading is making sure they go where they need to go, right? I think there's a there I think there is a difference between management and leadership. I mean, I think there's there's management could live some parts of management can live inside of leadership, but sometimes managers don't make good leaders. What, what do you think what what are your thoughts on that? I'd love to hear your thoughts on the difference between like management or managing and leading or leadership. Yeah, that's a personality style thing. So we've got um a lot of people who uh make great leaders but are not great managers and a lot of people that are great managers that are not great people. Mm-hmm. I think I, I could tell you the biggest mistake, and this is like the biggest tell that somebody is an amateur manager is when they try to be friends with their employees. That's like the kiss of death. When, when, you know, we, and back, you know, I invented the uh, vapor vaporizer, the forerunner of all digital vaporization technology, well, all the vapes that you see. Mm-hmm. And I remember we had hired a guy who was a super nice guy, And this guy comes in first day and I'm just watching him and he did great in the interviews. 
And then I'm watching him with the employees and he's just trying to make nice with everybody. And I'm like, okay, well, that's cool. It's his first day. And then by day two, he's like really trying to be friends. He's like buying them coffee and like, you know, doing that stuff. And I was like, man, I can time this one on my watch. This is not going to go well. And sure enough, he uh, imploded and we had to get another guy. But you can always tell because one of the things I, you know, I, I tell people now that are in management positions is that you are not going to gain respect of your employees by them being your friends. They will, it will actually have the opposite effect, right? right? They don't necessarily need to fear you. Although in some cases that's not really a bad thing as long as it's not unreasonable fear, but, um, they need to respect you. And there's a big difference and they will appreciate you more if they respect you. And that's 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 what we teach. But it's a it's a really easy way to catch a noob manager and uh, uh, one that's you know one that's experienced. Is the one that's experienced will get in, head down to the nose. He'll be reasonable. He'll be fair. He'll be compassionate. You know, he'll go out of his way to hear the employees. But by no means is dude having a tequila with him after work. Yeah, yeah. Um... <clears throat> That leads that dovetails nicely into the conversation about empathy, and 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 tactical empathy. I think to, to you know that's something that when I was going through the book, I'm like, this is coming up. This is this has come up, and and Chris Boss mentions it right right out of the gate. We hear about empathy from people like Brene Brown, and people who are against empathy, like Paul Bloom, and then we hear you know we actually have had empathy and applied empathy discussed on the podcast before. Empathy gets a lot of play right now. Can you talk? Uh, for those who are not familiar with what tactical empathy is, what it what you believe it to be, and how you've used it in your businesses and in your and in your life, I guess technically. Yeah, sure. Interestingly enough, and I think that's a term that was really popularized by Chris, by Chris Voss. And it's it's funny, you know. I remember the first time I met Chris, and you're like, "Man, this guy's a, a FBI negotiator. He's a hostage negotiator. He's like." You know, if he didn't do his job right, there'd be bodies lining up outside. And he's, you know, he's a tough, like, Chicago-style guy, you know, that comes in and he talks like, I'm cool, man. And, you know, like, this guy's been in the streets. Like, right. this, is, this is a guy who is as real as it gets, as genuine as he gets. And so you would imagine that he would be a no-nonsense, no-bullshit, like, fucking super aggressive dude. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> And the fact is, when you meet him, he is the absolute sweetest guy you'll ever meet. And you could, in a negotiation, say something to the guy like, um, well, that's ridiculous. I'd never pay that much. And you would expect him to, to come back with something much more aggressive. And I'm, I'm simplifying this. Mm -hmm. But he would come back and say, you would never pay for something like this, which is a technique that he teaches yep. called mirroring, which yep. is basically repeating back the same thing that the other person said. And it makes the other person feel heard. It's a new style of negotiating, and not, not a new style of negotiating, but the, a, a style of negotiating that he's popularized. Right. Because the old style of negotiating, if you look at like guerrilla negotiating, I think it was written by Levinson, who's I'm a big fan of that that book. And there were there were lots of other negotiating books back in the day of the 80s talking about win-win negotiating and you know how you come in and assert your case and you know you you uh uh counter all their points and you win and you make sure they have a little win and you win. Instead of that, tactical empathy really like in his book never split the difference is saying you don't want to split the difference. Splitting the difference is you both lose. Mm -hmm. Instead, right, you, you don't want half a baby. Right. You don't, you don't want to split the baby. Right. What, what you want to do is to make sure that the other side feels heard mm -hmm. and you're using empathy as one of your swords, as a tool in order to get what you want and have the other side feel like they get what they want. And, and I, I recommend to everybody, get Chris Voss's book, Never Split the Difference, and check out his masterclass. He's got a really good freaking yeah. masterclass. Through the masterclass um, program. that if, you, if you're on Facebook, you've probably seen the advertisement yeah, yeah. of the masterclass. Um, Shaheen, uh, again, <laughs> as I went through the book, some of the things that came up were uh, not just a lot of people that I recognized, but a lot of things that made me that reminded me of people. So tactical empathy is one of them. Another one was patience, and the name that came to mind there, oddly enough, although I have mentioned this before on previous episodes, was Gary Vaynerchuk. And you'd think, 
most people be like, wait a minute, he's the hustle guy. He talks about hustle, hustle, hustle. But when I've seen him speak, he talks about patience. And you talk about the patient's stake. Can we touch on that? Because I, I found that I, I think a lot of people get when, when they think entrepreneurs and especially again, when re, again, I'll come back to that introduction that felt like hurry that felt like hustle. Like, you know, I mean, I know that, that there's and I'll, I'll drop a little, you were, you were going to be having a meditation thing and you were going to, there was a party and all this stuff that was going on, but it felt very frenetic to me. Like the whole, that whole cadence of that, that opening, which again was great. It felt like, you know, that's what you want. You want a nice cold open. Right. Um, and, uh, so where does patience fit? Because I think a lot of people struggle with that. They're thinking they, they want it right here, right now, and they're not willing to pay, play the long game. Yeah. I like to use this example that I also used in my book. You got to become a professional waiter in life. That's something that my, my friend Stuart Wilde would say. And if, if you look at the example of nature and you look at the wild, you look at Big cats. I'm a big fan of big cats. I love um, jaguars and lions and tigers and stuff. I love. You don't, have a, you don't have a serval, do you, at home? Like, like oh, a what? The serval are those big cats that you see people domesticate, specifically in oh, Russia. No if you're on TikTok, you and type in serval, S E R V A L, you will see okay. like these big cats walking around houses. You're like, I would be, I would be both. <laughs> so I see it. I'm like, this is majestic and terrifying all the same oh, time. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, continue. I, I, I'm a fan of animals in their yeah. natural habitat. I'm not yeah, really yeah. a fan <laughs> of like <laughs> them at my house or at zoos. <laughs> but um, <clears throat> yeah, and I remember I was in the Amazon. I stayed with these tribes, uh, this tribe called the Matis. Mm -hmm. um, and these guys were former cannibals and I, I hung out in the jungle with them for a while. And I remember watching this like and 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 by the way, when you're with um, native people in in their in in the jungle settings, like an activity like watching a wild animal appear is like that's it. That's all that's going on for the day. Like <clears throat> they will sit and they will just watch all day long this happening. And I remember watching this like beautiful black jaguar, which is you think happens all the time in the jungle. It's rare. I was there for, for months and, you know, really, I think two times we saw a jaguar and it was for seconds. And we saw this cat come <clears throat> and you think, okay, what makes this cat an, <clears throat> an effective predator? <clears throat> what makes this cat a, a useful um, creature? And so you're watching it and it would wait forever. It would sit back. You see these like bright yellow eyes like just through these like leaves and it would just be patient <clears throat> and you realize this is a cat that could probably jump like 40 feet in the air and like hop trees and gates and do all kinds of stuff but ultimately it's the fact that it's a stalker the fact that it's got patience is the reason why it's effective and if you want to be effective in business, in life, in any of these things, you want to become what Carlos Castaneda, the great uh, author, <coughs> author from the 1960s, 70s, and 80s, would say, you want to become a person of power, you want to become a stalker, you want to have the ability to stalk your prey. I'm using that symbolically. Obviously, sure. please don't become a stalker in the, in the weird sense of it. But... You want to have the quality of patience because others will lack in that discipline. And when they lack in that discipline, you can pounce and take advantage. It's exactly what we teach on Amazon. We teach people, hey, find a niche, look for the vulnerability, and then you know people follow our system that we teach on our FBA seller course. And you follow the system you find the niche, you find the vulnerability, and then you just wait. You wait until the right opportunity, and then you pounce. And that's how it works. That's pretty interesting. <clears throat> when you think about Amazon, the first thing you think about is prime and instantaneism. Like everything happens instantaneously as a consumer, but you're right, as a seller. I mean, I have I've a friend of mine who does, uh, <clears throat> he, he does he, he's done pretty well. He's based out of Atlanta, and he's done pretty well with niches and so on and so forth, following the, the principles of just, and, and a lot, I remember seeing him, <clears throat> 
met him for the first time. One of the things he asked me, we're drinking out of the, we're in the Philippines, right? My wife and I were at a conference. I was speaking at this conference that Chris Ducker was having and he, and he, we're drinking out of these glasses. And I think someone at the table said, oh man, this is a really cool glass. And he leaned forward and goes, really? What do you like about it? Like it was one of those conversations. I'm like, all right. So this guy's always, like you said, he's always kind of looking, right? Always kind of, but not ready to necessarily act. Just like, okay, like noted, noted, noted. And, and that brings me to a question about journaling because every time I talk about journaling on this podcast or, or whenever I talk about it in general, I bring up that I think it's the most undervalued and underrated productivity tool out there because it gives you, it's the story. It gives you perspective. It, it, it shows you like, oh, these are the lessons I've learned along the way. It allows you to course correct quickly. I prefer journaling, honestly, compared to David Allen's GTD weekly review because journaling allows me to fix things faster than say the massive endeavor of doing a weekly review. You journaled, but you didn't necessarily, and I, I know a bit, again, a bit of a spoil, you didn't call them journal entries per se, right? What do you, do you still do that? It, like, do you still do what you, what you talk about in the book? And can you share a little bit about that with people and, and how the power of, of chronicling or keeping that story going or tell, or, you know, chronicling things as you go through has helped you? Yeah, I teach about that in my book, Billion, um, How I Became King of the Thrill Cult, which, by the way, the audiobook just dropped on Audible for anybody who likes Audible books, but there's a hardcover too. Um, so I write about that. Uh, look, <laughs> I think if you fucking hate doing it, don't do it. There's yeah. a lot of people who just can't get to journaling. And uh, look, it's something you should do for yourself, mm -hmm. but nothing that you should feel compelled to do just because uh, you know some some influencers telling you to do it or you see it on Instagram or people are talking about it with that said i think journaling gives you perspective and process it's like having a friend that you can tell anything to at any time and have them repeat it to you in a non-judgmental way and that's the great thing about journaling. I love journaling when I travel. And I actually take it another level. I don't just write. I will take clips. So I will cut out pages from magazines and newspapers and cut out pictures that I find inspiring in the airline magazines or uh, you know, my, my train tickets if I go travel. I'm a big big fan of of travel or um you know I'll 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 take like a flower that I might find on the street a little dried flower and I'll put it in my journal. So my journals are are really three dimensional when I travel. Uh, not so much when I'm when I'm home, uh, but there's there's something about pen and paper. There's something about the process of physically writing that changes the way our brains work. Mm -hmm. And I think likely that's why you feel it's so effective for you. But I'll say there's periods of times where I just don't fucking feel like it and I don't do it. I mean, I've got my cabinet back there filled with stacks and stacks of journals all the way from the 1990s to now, maybe from the 1980s when I was a kid. And sometimes I burn them, sometimes I throw them away, and sometimes I, I keep them forever. I don't know why. Um, but... Um, it's also very cool to look back and see what you were doing at that time in history and to learn from your past. Because one of the things I often talk about is something when, when you look at people who have successful lives, who are successful human beings, not just financially, but from a sense of, of just being good people and, and personally advanced humans, you can always trace it down to the fact that they've been self-reflective in their lives. The act of self-reflection, the act of just looking back and going, man, I was a fuck up, or man, I'm an asshole, I need to fix something, is something that not a lot of people talk about because it's not very popular. And especially in today's shiny thing culture where you look on social media, you look on Instagram, you look on YouTube, and there's somebody, you know, waving a shiny object at you. And for most people, it's really easy to fall into that trap of the shiny thing because 
it's like buying a lottery ticket. They can tell themselves, hey, man, I tried. And if it fails, it's somebody else's fault. Yeah. So, hey, I signed up for the course. I did this. And that's it. Imagine how many freaking Tony Robbins books are sitting on a shelf with the plastic wrap still on them, his programs, because people bought into the program and now they're off the hook. They don't have to have the hustle. They don't have to sleep on the factory floor like, like I did or like people like Elon Musk. Not that I'm anything like Elon Musk, but people like Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and, and those guys are are, 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 are doing. When you look at those guys, those guys fucking work hard. You look at Jeff Bezos, people are like, oh, he's just some Silicon Valley nerd. He got lucky. Bullshit. That dude's a fucking genius. That dude's the smartest guy in the room. That dude went out. He found cheap money from Wall Street, brought it to Silicon Valley, built an e-commerce platform, wasn't afraid to lose money for 10, 20, 50 years, however long it took until he created a disruptive economy. And that's exactly what he did. And not only that, people look at him and go, oh, he's going to be the first trillionaire. I don't know, is it going to be Musk or Bezos, those assholes, whatever. It's like, nobody, you're the asshole. Do you know how many millionaires and billionaires these guys have created? More than any other people in history ever. And in the next 10, 20 years, there will be more millionaires and more billionaires created just by the wealth that they've brought in new wealth you know shaheen we could keep going but i want to be respectful of your time um the book the book is called billion right and uh, i'm looking at it right now um it it is <laughs> you got to pick up this book because there's stuff we, we didn't even get to talk about the walkman do you still own a walkman do you have like do you have like the thing that like i know i keep certain sentiment you keep sentimental things too i mean you talk about the travel do you have a walkman that, like, that's like on display to remind you of some of those things that you learned while on the walkman or is it all on the phone now no i i wish i did you know what the game changer for me was with the yeah. sony walkman first so we got to do a little young explain in here mike yeah, I, yeah, I yeah. Fair, enough, fair. fair enough you know so yeah you go Let's put it this way. The big pen, the cassette thing that you see on Facebook sometimes when you put the big pen plus like only people our age know what that means or older like, oh, yeah, that's how we used to rewind tapes. The Walkman was basically the, the first real portable solo music device or, or well, music or audio book or audio program device that you could walk around with. And it was the Sony Walkman that popularized it. So some if you if you Google it or go on YouTube or watch some of the older stuff on Netflix nowadays that's highlighting it, you'd be like, wow, you guys used to walk around with those things? Yes, yes, we did. And they were great. They were a marvel for us, right? Yeah, I remember the game changer for me was the yellow Sony Walkman that was water waterproof. resistant. Water resistant. <laughs> it wasn't, you're right, it wasn't waterproof because if you put it, you found out pretty quickly. You, you could have it on like in the pool, by the pool, but if it yeah. fell in the pool... Then that, it's, 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 <laughs> nothing in the eighties was waterproof, man. Okay, nothing in the eighties was waterproof. What color were the headphone muffs that you had on yours? Blue or orange? Yellow, yellow. yellow. Yeah, yeah. The yellow, orangeish. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So mine were blue because they. I think you oh. could get either, right? Like, or you could oh, replace yeah. them. Eventually, they said that you could buy like here, personalize it. But that's how you personalized your. Wa you put stickers on it, of course. People would do that. Oh, yeah. But the other way, it was like the first accessory. <laughs> Oh, and then eventually, remember, they changed from like the the headband style, like kind of what to the ear, the first set of earbuds, really, like the ones that would fit. Like they they were still a band, but they were really tiny, and they looked a lot like what earbuds would be nowadays. Um, yeah. Oh man, I remember those things. Uh, Duran Duran playing through my uh, through my <laughs> through my Walkman. Um, yeah, yeah. So so that's the stage. So you so you had the, the it, that was a game changer for you, the the Sony Walkman. There was Sony Walkman was absolutely a game changer. Yeah. And I, I, I oftentimes talk about, you know, my, my folks, you know, when I came up, we were, we were relatively poor growing up in a, in a gentrified neighborhood that quickly gentrified after we moved in. Mm -hmm. And I remembered that, you know, we rarely bought new things and my folks would go to garage sales oftentimes. And I, I made my dad buy me this like big box of like cassette tapes that some dude had under his bed. And they were all bootleg tapes. And now remember, I barely spoke English at this time. Yeah. And I realized it was all like Elton John, Pink Floyd. I didn't even know the police. Yeah. I didn't even know this existed. Once I got that box, I don't think I left my room for months. 
I mean, I had that Walkman on my ears listening to those. I mean, I wore out those tapes. Yeah. And I remember that was definitely uh, 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 an awakening in the 1980s. I was like, oh, my God, this shit's good. What well, can I get more? And I learned English to, from, to a great part to that in MTV. Have you have you seen Blinded by the Light? Uh, no. What's that? Watch it. It's um, about it's basically a guy who is a huge Bruce Springsteen fan. I can't remember. I think he's oh, in yeah. India. I want to say they're in India, but he like buys the jean jacket. He wears like the white. T- it's so good. And it's 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 basically a, a it's a story between a father and a son. It's really good. I saw it on a flight once. Um, uh, and I was like, it was interesting. The flight to where I was going, I saw Rocket Man. Oh, and yeah? on the way home, I watched Blinded by the Light. So it was like a musical, like cavalcade of travel. And I, I do remember with Rocket Man, I didn't shed a tear. It was a good film. But on the way back with Blinded by the Light, I was like, oh no, it's just, it's just our, it's just. <laughs> <laughs> but it's really like if you have a chance to watch it, because I mean, as soon as you start talking about it, it reminded me a bit about that film. So. Uh, blinded by the light it's it's a uh, i think it, you can watch it on netflix or or amazon prime now or something like that uh something tells me you know a bit about amazon so before we wrap up talk uh, not just about the book which we'll have a link in the show notes but tell us a little bit about amazon mastery sure so a while ago i started looking at the amazon platform and i started thinking about how i could empower people to create wealth by starting these amazon companies so i started this course and a lot of people came on, a lot of people are making a lot of money successfully now through our program. Look, I have a one hour course from beginning to end and one hour, I'll teach you everything you need to know about starting an Amazon business from anywhere in the world. Canada, I've got people in South Africa, I've got people in United Arab Emirates, I've got people from all over the world uh, starting these Amazon companies. And we teach you how to pick a product how to get reviews, how to get your product up, and how to get it selling from anywhere in the world. So you don't really need to know how to do anything. We teach you how to incorporate and how to do it for little or no money. And if anybody's interested, it's normally 200 bucks because they heard it on the Mike Vardy show. I'm going to give it to everybody on your show for free. Zero dollars, zero obligation, no credit card. You'll never hear from us again if you don't want to. Um, so just reach out to me by email. It's going to be D-A-R-K-Z-E-S-S at gmail.com. Let me know you heard it on Mike Vardy's show, and I will give you the one-hour crash course for free. If you want to check out my larger course, it's FBASellerCourse.com, and um, also my book, Billion, How I Became King of the Throw Pill Cult, is out now. So please take a look at it. If you love it, hate it, leave me a review. Appreciate that. Shaheen, thanks so much for having a productive conversation with me today. I had a great time. Thanks, buddy.